Now, you, you may remember that uh, the idea of this uh, stunning series was to address contemporary controversies. And what we're doing tonight is really not addressing a contemporary controversy so much as a perennial, uh, an eternal controversy, an eternal difficult question, namely, why does God permit, allow evil? Why, if God is good and all-powerful, is there evil in the world, uh, which all of us experience? And some people experience very bitterly. How is this compatible with the Christian idea of God? Well, uh, I, I, what I thought I would do is take a reflection of Pope John Paul II on this theme. More specifically, it was on the theme of suffering, uh, which... Uh, it took form in this letter of his, I mean, long letter, 17,000 words. Uh, that's one of his shorter ones, actually. Uh, called in Latin, after its first words, salvifici doloris, which means saving, redemptive suffering. And this is a letter to all the faithful of the Catholic Church on the Christian meaning of human suffering. Now, I think the first thing we want to do is go back and put this in some kind of context. And it's not a bad idea to begin with the assassination attempt on him, which uh, took place, you remember, on the 13th of May, 1981. This letter was published in February 1984, and you, you, uh, you know, you'll be familiar with the story. There was this Ali Agka, a Turkish gunman, who, um, hired by whoever he may have been hired, most probably by the KGB and um, communist forces in the East, Eastern Europe, um, tried to assassinate John Paul II, and he fired four bullets until he was uh, overpowered by a security man and a nun. <laughs> uh, valiant lady, obviously. Uh, he fired four bullets, or well, or rather four, four of the bullets he fired hit the Pope, and two went uh, into his intestines. And one hit his right arm, and one hit his left hand. Now, a uh, finger of his left hand. And in, uh, they, they say, I, uh, you wonder how they can be quite so sure about this, but the fact that the bullet hit a finger deflected the bullet, and the, the bullet was going in the direction of, of uh, the base of his spinal cord. So had it, had it gone, had it not been deflected, uh, he would have been paralyzed um, from the waist down for ever after. But the, the two that went, the two bullets that went inside him into his intestines, one of them just missed the main abdominal vein by about five or six millimeters. Had it hit that um, it would have burst it and uh, he would have died of loss of blood in five minutes. So it was as close as that. That's why he said he felt that Our Lady was guiding the course of the bullet and deflecting it from him. Come in, Anna. Uh, now, it, it's a, it's a it's an interesting story because he, he fell down. He was in the uh, Pope mobile and he collapsed onto the floor. And at first they thought, oh, maybe it wasn't too bad. And then they realized, no, he was still losing a lot of, uh, well, his, his pulse and his blood pressure. Uh, when they were taken, it became clear that the Pope was in, in great danger and an ambulance was summoned. Now, 
and he was taken off to th this hospital. And the main surgeon at that hospital was, uh, was not there. He was actually at that time in another hospital. And uh, a sister told him, oh, um, the, the Pope has just been shot. It, was, it went out on the news immediately. And so this fellow jumped into his car, uh, went high speed the wrong way down a one-way street to get to the hospital. And there was a policeman with a machine gun at the end. And this policeman was, you know, stop. Uh, well, he managed to persuade the policeman uh, that instead of um, shooting him or stopping the car, uh, he should give him an escort to the hospital. And so he got to the hospital in time. But still, the Pope lost three quarters of his blood, uh, which is quite uh, terrifying, really. And he, and he had to be, he was operated on for about six or seven hours. Uh, to stop the blood loss and he had to have transfusions and all of that and one of the transfusions because so much blood was needed one of the transfusions was uh, of fresh fairly fresh blood that hadn't been um, sort of checked properly and that meant that some months later because of that blood he got something very nasty called cytomegalovirus infection and had to go back into hospital I, well, I suppose you, you won't remember this, or well, Gainel and I will remember these things, but he, he had to go back into hospital to be, um, to be treated again. But it was uh, a, a rather terrifying experience. Well, now, I, I just mention that because in a certain sense, obviously the Pope was, was bedridden for a long time, and uh, this was... Um, part of the background to his writing on suffering three years later, though uh, it, that, that needs some qualification. Now, I don't know if any of you have read it. Have you? Have any of you read it? No. Um, it's, it's one of his most personal writings, definitely, and I mean, any pope, when he's writing an encyclical, uh, is helped by other people. You know, he doesn't necessarily write every word himself, uh, or if he write, may write great bits of it, and then other people will check it and what not. But uh, it, it, this does bear very much his mark. And I would say it was, it was prompted in some ways. I, he probably wouldn't have written if, it, it, if he hadn't had this experience of the assassination attempt. It was published just six weeks after he went to see Ali Agka in, in the prison. You may know that story. He went to, to speak with him. He was a very strange man. Well, he, I think he, he's still alive, isn't he? He's a very strange man, and away with the fairies, rather. But um, he, certainly his family appreciated the Pope's um, gestures towards him. Uh, but it, so it was occasioned. I don't think this would have happened if there hadn't been this extraordinary event in St. Peter's Square on the 13th of May, 1981. But its roots go much deeper and wider. Now, he says here, this is wonderful John Paul II kind of sentence. Uh, Suffering accompanies man at every point on earth. In a certain sense, it coexists with him in the world and thus demands to be constantly reconsidered. And it's probably true to say that suffering had accompanied uh, Karol Wojtyła all his life. He would have, during the occupation of Poland in the Second World War, he would have experienced hunger and cold. He was on one occasion knocked down by a lorry. His shoulder was broken and he ended up in a ditch spent some time in a ditch until some good Samaritan uh, rescued him. Uh, the whole, as we know, the whole history of Poland was a, was a painful history, especially during World War II and the communist years, and the whole history of the 20th century, especially in a way of the first half. It's calculated that uh, something like 190 million people died from violent deaths in the course of the 20th century. Huge figure, been huge suffering within that time. 
And then as a priest and a bishop and a pope, he would have met suffering as, as any priest tends to do. People reveal their own suffering to him. Now the letter is dated significantly the 11th of February. Um, do you know what feast day 11th of February is? Hmm? Sorry? Our Lady of Sorrows. Of, of Lourdes. Our Lady of Lourdes. Not Our Lady of Sorrows, but Our Lady of Lourdes. Our Lady of Lourdes. And uh, that's significant. And there's a story, it just came back to me today, and I can't remember who told it to me, and whether, I don't know if any of you can verify it to me. But, uh, I mean, in some ways, of course, Pope John Paul II had enjoyed good health all his life. He was a very active man. He used to go skiing and all that kind of thing and swimming and all of that. Um, and when he, he went to Lourdes early on in his pontificate and he met Jean Vanier and Jean Vanier um, said to him, well, no, he said to Jean Vanier, oh gosh, all this awful suffering. And, and Jean Vanier said, no, this isn't awful suffering at all. This is suffering transformed by love. And it was a uh, uh, that was a kind of moment of illumination for John Paul II. That would have been earlier. And so it, it's, it's no coincidence that the letter is dated the 11th of February. And for the last 30, 40 years, the 11th of February each day in the church has been a world day of the sick. Uh, the Pope always writes a letter. He's written one for this yeah, the World Day of the Sick. So he's connecting with that whole world of the, um, of the sick. So, so the, anyway, there's a lot that lies behind all this. Now, this, um, the interesting thing, okay, it, it, um, the title. The title, it, it, two words in, in Latin, and the second word means suffering. Suffering, so that... <laughs> Hello, hi. Uh, the, um, and uh, he doesn't, the, the Pope, address the abstract question of evil. He addresses the more concrete, experiential, human experience of suffering. If you ask what is evil, you're away into abstractions and philosophy and theology and so, so on. But if you ask what is suffering, what is the meaning of suffering, you're talking to human beings because every human being knows about suffering. Suffering is the experience of evil, you can't separate the two, but suffering is the personal side of evil. It's very typical of John Paul II to do that, to take that kind of approach, to go to uh, what this is like for a human being, what this thing is like from a human aspect, to look at it uh, anthropologically, to use the, the long word. That's important. And uh, also that, well, let me come back to that in a minute. Uh, the, just to show the outline. It's a very beautiful writing and it, it, it's, it's rather like um, a piece of music. It's rather like a, a piece of chamber music and the way it's arranged and its structure. Now it's got eight parts. It's got an introduction and a conclusion which are fairly quite, quite simple. And then you've got, uh, what he looks at first is uh, this may not be legible from, where, from the back but anyway uh, the world of suffering, the world of suffering, and then the, the nub of the thing is in the three centre bits, three, four, and five, which are like uh, a triptych. And in the middle is Christ, who gives on, his, on the cross the answer to the question of the meaning of suffering. Here you have searching for the answer in number three and a detailed look at the book of Job and then the consequences of Christ's um, taking on of suffering, the vocation to share the suffering of Christ which is especially embodied in Paul, St. Paul. And then 
what he calls the gospel of suffering, which is of which an aspect, but it's an aspect he makes a separate chapter of, is the Good Samaritan. Now, this, uh, in a, he, had a very, he had an unusual mind, uh, Pope John Paul II, and the way he went at things was, was rather unique. In one question, you can look at this uh, letter from two points of view. One is that he, he's circling round a question, and the question is, what is the meaning of suffering? That's the question he's trying to answer or explore whether there is an answer. What is, the, what is the meaning of human suffering? Why? The great question, why? This is what happens to any of us when something awful happens. Why? Why should I get cancer or why should my wife get cancer or my, why should my child be run over by a bus or whatever. Why? 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 This, this tormenting question. From another point of view, I say that's like a circular. He's going round in circles, the Pope. Uh, from another point of view, he's on a journey. He's kind of following a straight line. And this is where the other word in the title is important, salvifici in Latin, which means salvific, which means bringing salvation. Suffering that brings salvation. And this is the beginning. Uh, from the introduction, number one, declaring the power of salvific suffering, the Apostle Paul says, in my flesh I complete what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. Now that's from the letter to the Colossians, chapter 1, verse 24. In my flesh I complete, this is Paul speaking, I complete what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. And now, and then the Pope says something extraordinary, really. These words are found at the end of the long road that winds through the suffering, which forms part of the history of man and is illuminated by the word of God. The end of the long road. These words have, as it were, the value of a final discovery, which is accompanied by joy. So he, he begins with the point he's going to get to at the end, which is that suffering can be a means of taking part in the redemptive work of Christ. That is a, a new revelation that comes to us from the cross of Christ. It's a new light shown, sh thrown on this whole mystery of suffering and evil. So that's where he's getting to, but he takes kind of a long time to get there. So he goes through the whole journey. So it, it's as if he's taking us on a journey. He, I think what lies behind this to put it more concretely, I mentioned the assassination attempt, but there he was, you know, you're lying in a hospital bed and you're thinking, well, why has this happened to me and I'm the Pope and what use am I as Pope lying in bed um, when I should be going around the world or celebrating the liturgy and all those things. And I think he pondered deeply on what is the meaning of this experience for him and it led him back to what he knew already, of course, that in some way this was part of his mission as Pope was to suffer for the church, and, and that the, the, the meaning of this suffering lay there. And then he wanted to share that with his fellow Christians very much, because perhaps he felt that often people don't realize the salvific power that lies in what they suffer. The, um, you'd have heard of Bishop Fulton Sheen, and he used to say, in, he used to feel when 
going past hospitals, there's all this wasted suffering. That, that people are suffering and they're just thinking, gosh, this is awful, what's the meaning of this, what's the point of this? When it could be grafted onto Christ, I mean, maybe it secretly is, of course, but it could be grafted on, onto Christ and, and be helping the work of redemption in the church. And I think he, the Pope John Paul wanted to remind us all of this simple truth, that, that suffering is a positive good, can be a positive good. In itself, it's an evil. In itself, it's something we legitimately seek to avoid, but it can have a good effect. It can have a salvific power. It can take part in the, in the suffering of, uh, of Christ, which was redemptive. So that's the, in a way, that's it. So just to follow the journey, or to begin to follow the journey, and then we'll, um, so, th so this letter really is, is to, to go on this journey to explore the meaning of suffering. It's a meditation on suffering. Now, um, okay, part two, the world of suffering. This is, this is in a way more descriptive. He, but he, he says that it's not enough just to describe suffering. We want to try and understand what it is, what it, what's going on here. Medicine, he says, uncovers, tries to deal with one whole area of suffering, but there is more. So there is a distinction uh, between physical suffering, when the body is hurting, and what is often called moral suffering, pain of the soul. Pain of the soul. We all know that. It's not just physical suffering, we get a toothache or something, that's, that's all very real, uh, but we can be feeling unhappy. Uh, we can be suffering at other levels of our being. Man is, man is body and soul, and so we suffer in our, our body and we suffer in our soul, not that the two can be entirely separated because sufferings, sufferings of the soul uh, impinge upon the body and sufferings of the body uh, affect the soul as well, of course, we're one, we're one being. Now, scripture, he says, uh, when he's, he, he was trying to explore, he, he's beginning off, this is him as a phenomenologist, exploring the world of suffering. Here, here's this great human fact of suffering. What's it look like? And he, he uses scripture here. And he says, let us quote from the books of the Old Testament a few examples of situations which bear the signs of suffering and above all moral suffering. And he mentions these, they're all biblical references in the back, but these are familiar to us from the Psalms, for example. The Psalms are full of sufferings of one kind or another. The danger of death, the death of one's own children, especially the death of the firstborn and the only son. Then to the lack of offspring, Nostalgia for the homeland, persecution and hostility of the environment, mockery and scorn of the one who suffers, loneliness and abandonment, and again, remorse of conscience, the difficulty of understanding why the wicked prosper and the just suffer, the unfaithfulness and ingratitude of friends and neighbours, and finally, the misfortunes of one's own nation. Those are all, you find all those sufferings in the Old Testament. But he says there's also a kind of other book, there's, there's the written book of scripture, there's the only partly written book of human history and of each individual person's biography and the suffering in that. <coughs> now, we suffer this is him being kind of philosophical, I suppose. We suffer when we experience an evil. That's what's going on. An evil touches us, hits us some kind. That's what causes suffering to us. And he points out, uh, I mean, I didn't know this, an interesting thing, that the Old Testament didn't have a distinct word for suffering and evil. They have one word for the same thing. 
And it's in Greek and in the New Testament that you get the word I suffer, pasco, pasco, I suffer, I suffer. And that allows for the distinction to be made between suffering, which is what I undergo, and the evil that causes it. Now suffering therefore prompts the question, what is evil? What is evil? So he does ask that question, what is evil? And here he says this, the Christian response to it is different, for example, from the one given by certain cultural and religious traditions which hold that existence is an evil from what, which one needs to be liberated. The, the, there are philosophies in the world, maybe Buddhism approaches this, so Buddhism is so complex that it's risky to say, make any generalization about it, but that just sort of being here is not a good thing. And somehow you, 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 you've got to get out of existence in order to get out of suffering. That existence and suffering are pretty well identical. To be is to suffer, really. Now the Christian view isn't that. Because Christianity proclaims the essential good of existence and the good of what exists. It acknowledges the goodness of the creator and proclaims the good of what he creates. So man suffers on account of evil, which is a certain lack, limitation, or distortion of good. So good comes first in the Christian view. God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. It was very good. Evil in the Christian view, is a secondary reality. It's like a parasite on being. Does that make sense? Uh, sort of, yeah. Uh, and so he says, we could say that man suffers because of a good in which he does not share, from which in a certain sense he is cut off, or of which he has deprived himself. Well, that's, that's all fairly obvious, that why we suffer is we expect a good thing. We expect to be healthy. We expect uh, to be not to be insulted by people, for example. <laughs> you know, most of the time. Uh, we expect not to be insulted by people, or, or we expect to be treated justly. We expect to get our wages at the end of the week or the end of the month. And if we don't, we suffer, because we've been deprived of a good which we legitimately expect. Um, so that's, uh, yes, uh, he particularly suffers when he ought, in the normal order of things, to have a share in this good and does not have it. Thus, in the Christian view, the reality of suffering is explained through evil which always, in some way, refers to a good. So evil is a lack, a limitation, or a distortion of the good, he says. That's it. But the good comes first. It's, it's, um, this is the Christian world view, which means that you, um, in the end you have to smile, really, because good, good comes first and good will be at the end. Evil is, is a sort of temporary measure in the middle. Uh, and so there it is, which doesn't diminish its horror, but it's there. So um, that takes us to that. Yeah, this is interesting too. He, he, he goes on like that. that. That suffering, this is, yeah, this is an interesting point. If you, when you suffer, uh, it separates you from other people in many ways. I mean, if you're, if you're ill, then you, you, know, you have to stay at home and lie in bed and that's it, and the rest of the world gets on with its business. Uh, you're, you're, you're separated. And yet, in another way, suffering binds us together. It's a, 
It's a paradox because we, we do respond, he comes back to this much more later, but we respond to suffering. There's a sort of solidarity in suffering. We feel for other people who are suffering and we, we enter this world of suffering. It, it's an interesting little thought, that one. And he also says that uh, suffering can take on, again, this is all common sense observations really, but particular intensity at times of natural disasters or uh, if, if you have uh, an epidemic, for example, or bad harvest, lack of food and famine, or, he says, um, war, most terribly, and then he mentions World War II and the present threat, writing in the 1980s, which hasn't really gone away, but the present threat of nuclear self-destruction. And he says that actually suffering, that, that, that there's a, an accumulation of suffering in the present time, in the present world. It, it, it's, there's a lot of it about. And it is proportionate, he says, to man's mistakes and offences. Unfortunately, we are not living in accordance with God's will. And if we don't, suffering ensues. So, now those are just some observations of his uh, about the world of suffering. There it is in scripture, there it is in, in human history, human lives, moral suffering, physical suffering, suffering that separates us and yet unites us to others, suffering which comes from an experience of evil, but evil being subordinate, only comprehensible, if you like, in relation to good. Those are just some basic general observations about suffering. Now, do those seem to make sense to you? Do you think that's, yeah. Uh, there was one, one thing you said that I didn't quite understand in proportion to man's mistakes. And offences, yeah. He says, well, it, um, you might find the person who's actually a very good person. Oh, yes. Suffers quite, quite Don't worry, we're coming to that. <laughs> yes, yes, that's the big one, yes. Uh, uh, he's talking about the present state of human history, the sort of the world scene, where so much of it is due to human sin, really, as a matter of fact. Uh, aggression and injustice and so on, all those things are what's causing so much and what destabilizes the world and makes it, you know, we just don't know. It could suddenly explode tomorrow and we have World War Three and wipe each other out. And... and um, that wouldn't be innocent, really. Uh, though innocent people would suffer, but uh, it wouldn't be an innocent thing. But uh, that's it. Now, then he goes on to part three. Okay, so we get to sort of we get searching for an answer. And he says that, this is the question side, which is very strong, that when we suffer, um, we say, why? You know, why is it, why does this, why has this happened to me? That's one question. But, you, but why does it happen at all? If you've ever read Dostoevsky's great novel, the brothers Karamazov, one of the brothers there, Ivan Karamazov, it's a very, very powerful passage indeed. I mean, uh, but that he, he says, I cannot accept a world in which innocent, one innocent child suffers. What kind of world is that? And therefore, what kind of God is it who has created a world like that? Why? Why should there be this suffering? And in fact, um, th this adds a whole other layer to our suffering. I don't think, I mean, the Pope says this, and I'm sure there are animal lovers here, but I don't think animals ask the question, why? They suffer... You know, a dog suffers, um, you know, when it doesn't have its food or whatever, it, or when it's hurt, it suffers. But it, it's not also tormented by the question, why? Which we are. You know, we feel hungry, or we break our leg, or we, we undergo 
uh, nasty experiences at the hands of others, and we ask, why? Why? And that adds to our suffering. If we, if we knew why, half the suffering would vanish. I, I mean, I know an, an, a niece of mine, her first, the first child she had, it was a very painful experience giving birth to her first child. But she said, you knew it was worth it. You knew it was worth it. And so she wasn't tormented by the question why. It was a very painful experience. But she knew jolly well why. It was to bring a new life into the world. It doesn't have to be like that, Elizabeth. You know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, and uh, so uh, there are some sufferings that, or, you know, if we're, if we're uh, say we're into sport and, 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 and you've got to do all these exercises and, uh, you know, strain your muscles and go, do, do all this, you, you're not really tormented by the question why, because you know why. But other things, we, we don't know why. Man's inhumanity to man. You know, why? Why is uh, why, why do these things happen? Why does disease happen? Why do children suffer, in, innocent children suffer, and so forth? All those, all those questions. So, now, uh, and John Paul goes into all this. This can call, this is a question. So the question arises, and okay, I'm going to ask, uh, other people, I'm going to ask, you know, doctors or friends or something, why has this happened to me or to, to my friend? Uh, but I'm also going to put this question to God. Why? Why God? If you're what you're cracked up to be, why is this happening to me or in the world? Why? And he says this causes frustrations and conflicts in our relationship with God and may lead, uh, of course, to the denial of God. The trouble is that's not an answer to the question. Um, but God's image, God's image shines out in, in the goodness of the world and the goodness of people. And yet at the same time, it's obscured by many cases of undeserved suffering and of so many faults without proper punishment. And he says this is a very sensitive question, how you approach this question. Obviously when you're, you're uh, speaking with individuals, but even more generally than that, it requires a very sensitive approach, this whole matter. It really touches on something in our, in our lives. You can't just blunder in. Uh, with the answer, as it were. And God expects and listens to this question, the Pope says. God expects us to ask this question. It's part of our human dignity. It's part of the mind he's given us. Animals, it seems, don't ask the question. But we ask it. We ask it, and we can ask God, and God expects it, us to ask it, and he listens. And then that leads him into, of course, the book of Job. The book of Job, where this is precisely what happens. You, you're familiar, one of the great Old Testament books. And Job loses, on page one, he loses his possessions. Everything is destroyed, his house and goods and cattle and everything. He loses his family uh, and his children, all except his wife, and then he loses his health. He gets some terrible disease and he just has to sit on a dung heap scratching himself. And his friends hear of this and come along to sympathize with him and they say, oh poor old Joe, you must have done something really bad. You really must. And this is the view that suffering is retribution for human sin. Suffering belongs to the order of justice. God has set up the world. And if we play about with that world in a bad way, we suffer. Uh, if I drink too much, 
I damage my body. That's a kind of retribution, a punishment. That suffering is a punishment, in a certain sense, for my sin. You can say that. Um, but this, the whole point of the book of Job, is that that which is true up to a point, true in its way, is not the ultimate answer. Because Job, these friends, I mean, they're very eloquent and very poetic, and they really go for Job. In, in, and, and say, you know, who the heck do you think you are, really? You know? But Job keeps saying, I am innocent. I have not done anything wrong. I'm not a bad man. I'm a good man. And, and they bang on, and, and, and these chaps say, you just can't be, I'm sorry. You cannot be. Uh, you must have done something absolutely dreadful. And uh, he says, no, I haven't. I haven't. And he sticks to his guns. And then at the end, it's all rather mysterious, but in the end, sort of God um, speaks, you might say, and God ticks the friends off. And, he's, and, and he, he says, you're wrong. You haven't got it. You haven't got it. But Job hasn't got it either, really. And all that God, in a sense, just throws the question back, says, what do you know about it? it it's left open. It's left open at the end of the book, book of Job. So uh, there's no easy answer. So what we have here, this is, uh, is, is one, one has to be clear, and the Pope is very balanced about all this. It is true that suffering has a meaning as a punishment, but it is not true of all suffering, not true of innocent suffering. Punishment, which is the maintenance of the order of justice, that's why we put people in prison. Okay? Because, because they, they have shattered the social order in some way, they, they are destroying the social order, so we punish them by putting them in prison. And that's quite right. It's not the, that's not the whole purpose of a prison, but it's, that's fair enough. And as I say, if we play about with God's world, if we play about with ourselves, with our body, with our soul, with other people, we will suffer as a result. And that's written into the way things are. But it's not the complete answer to the question of suffering's meaning. The Old Testament also reveals that punishment is not simply retribution. It has a disciplinary and educative function. It, it, is, it is to teach us something about ourselves, about our own limits, for example, about reality, about the way things are. It, and it is also, well, same thing really, serves conversion. And this, you find this in the New Testament as well what the Pope calls the rebuilding of goodness in the subject, that often in the lives of great saints, like St. Saint Ignatius of Loyola and so on, they, they fall ill they, or they, they, they're wounded, uh, they're suffering physically, and that is a moment of conversion for them. So suffering changes us. It rebuilds, it makes us rethink our life. What am I doing with my life? And that's already in the Old Testament. He also says, and this emerges from the book of Job, that what Job undergoes was a test. Job was being tested. You remember how at the beginning, Satan says to God, look, you've got that chap down there who seems to be a good man. Let's find out whether he really is. You know, give me permission to you know, give him the fourth degree or whatever it is. And he, and he, he is tested and he's, he comes through the test, Job. Actually, so the suffering see, serves to reveal Job's righteousness. So suffering as retribution, suffering as test, and suffering as education, discipline, teaching, learning, a learning experience. Um, to, to suffer is to learn. We're always wiser after we've suffered. That's true. Um, but for the true answer to why, 
So why, the big question, that searching for an answer, we have to look at Christ. Okay, so I'll just begin that and then we can stop there really. But um, he, he says, yes, so we come to section four, which he says, Jesus Christ suffering conquered by love. What he says is that in, in the Old Testament and in a lot of human thought, suffering is connected with the order of justice, with our understanding of justice. And that is not quite enough because the real key to suffering, answer to suffering, lies in the order of love. That's really what he it comes to only love is the answer to the why of suffering and that is what Christ reveals but perhaps I will just stop there and come back to that afterwards so I don't know if anybody's got anything there but does that make sense so far it's on this journey he's taken us through the world of suffering the suffering that there is in the world He's, he's looked at this attempt to uh, go deeper that we find in the book of Job that go beyond a, an understanding of it simply as retribution, simply as punishment but uh, still waiting for the answer that comes with the cross of Christ with God himself taking on human suffering which is an extraordinary and unexplained mystery um, Simon. I, I just jotted down some thoughts as we were going through and as for the question why, I, I came up with kind of like a, another answer, mm -hmm. um, sort of like a modern day answer, because yes. why we always ask ourselves why, why all this suffering and the culture that we live in today, we live in kind of like a blame culture and we always look for someone mm. to blame, why is this happening mm. to me and so on, so mm. the concept of why the dog doesn't ask why yes. or whatever. That, that's the reason why we ask why. Yet, we already know the reason why, though, as Christians, we are the reason why. We are the reason that this suffering has been brought about. We turned our back on God, and that starts mm. with Adam and Eve. Yes, but it yes. continues on today's modern day Christians because we can lose sight of the bigger picture and turn our back on God, um, and that's why I found the redemptive suffering quite an interesting concept, because my thought on it is because evil touched our lives and turned us away from God and that ultimate salvation, mm. um, evil created that suffering, so is evil the only one who can then counterbalance the scales again and reunite us with God? through this suffering mm. um, and return us to our, to our current path, the, mm. the salvation. Um, so, you know, so can we honestly say that we live good Christian lives free of sin? Well, no, not really. We can't because we're only human and mm. we are fallible and God does know this. Mm -hmm. So when things do get difficult, evil does touch our lives. And it does drive us back towards God because mm -hmm. being the kind of people that we are, that when we are in suffering and when we are struggling, that's when we do turn to God with prayer and we do go mm -hmm. back to prayer and we pray our strongest mm -hmm. and we do come closest to him and he does touch our lives and he does give us that assistance. Um, and, you know, that's when we're at our strongest. And I see it as going round in a continuous circle because we've got back to God until evil then drives us around away again until mm. we hit that bottom yes. spot and we get driven back to God. Yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's uh, a, a, a good way of putting it. It reminds me of um, during World War II uh, there was um, a, a famous um, Allied Field Marshal called Slim, William Slim, and there was the campaign in Burma went on and uh, the, the Japanese drove the, um, the, the British back 
and then the tide turned and they went back the other way. And Slim um, was a great, a very great military commander, and he was walking. He used to like walking around the camp at night when people didn't know who he was and just eavesdropping on conversations. You see, and uh, this fellow said uh, he heard uh, he heard um, like a sergeant explaining to a private. He said, "Well, what we're going to do next is." Um, what, you know what the field might, what, we're going to advance to this place and we're going to have a battle here. And, we're going to, and this was, how do you know that? And he said, ah, oh, well, because our man, he always likes to give them a thrashing going back in where he took one going out. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a bit the same <laughs> with what you're saying, you see. That yes, Christ has, has, has taken on, and a lot of the fathers of the church would say that, uh, around the, the idea of death, particularly. Because in a sense, death is the ultimate evil that we experience. And therefore, Christ has, has took on death and turned it into a source of life. Uh, that's, the, that's the wonder of what he, he did. So he really grasped the nettle uh, and turned it into a rose, as it were. <laughs>